Psalm 58, beginning in verse number 1, the Bible reads, Do ye indeed speak righteousness, O congregation? Do ye judge uprightly, O ye sons of men? Yea, in heart ye work wickedness. Ye weigh the violence of your hands in the earth. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. Their poison is like the poison of a serpent. They are like the death adder that stoppeth her ear, which will not hearken to the voice of charmers, charming never so wisely. Break their teeth, O God, in their mouth. Break out the great teeth of the young lions. Let them melt away as waters which run continually. When he bendeth his bow to shoot his arrows, let them be as cut in pieces. As a snail which melteth, let every one of them pass away, like the untimely birth of a woman, that they may not see the sun. Before your pops can feel the thorns, he shall take them away as with a whirlwind, both living and in his wrath. The righteous shall rejoice when he seeth the vengeance. He shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked, so that a man shall say, Verily, there is a reward for the righteous. Verily, he is a God that judges in the earth. Let's bow our heads forward prayer. Father, I pray that you would please just speak to our hearts and speak through me tonight as I preach your word. And please just fill me with the Holy Spirit. Help me and everyone else that's here to... Uh, Put aside all the other things that might be on our mind at this time and all the cares of this life, our job, our, our, our house, our, our affairs. Dear God, please just help us to stay focused on your word. And I pray that you'd speak to us and ingrain these uh, great truths of your word into us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, in, uh, let me go through this psalm and I'm going to get into the sermon. But in verse number one, it reads, Do you speak righteousness, O congregation? Do ye judge uprightly, O ye sons of men? So basically, God here is questioning the rightness of what's being preached in church. Because the Old Testament never uses the word church. All the way throughout the Old Testament. And yet there was a church in the Old Testament. Because in the New Testament, when God speaks about it as in the Old Testament, He uses the word church. Like when He talks about Moses being with the church in the wilderness. In the Old Testament, it's referred to as the congregation. And so he says, do you indeed speak righteousness, O congregation? Do you judge uprightly, O ye sons of men? Yea, in heart ye work wickedness. Ye weigh the violence of your hands in the earth. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. Their poison is like the poison of a serpent. They are like the death adder that stopped their ear. And look at verse 5. Which will not hearken to the voice of charmers, charming never so wisely. Now let me stop there and explain this parallel to God's. God's basically talking about wicked, evil, violent people. And they are people who will not listen to God's word. Now, he's using the illustration of a snake. Now, there really is such thing as a snake charmer. Okay? I know because I read it in the Bible. And there also are in this world. Snake charmers. And a snake charmer, and you know, they're usually found in India and so forth, but they will play a flute or sing a song or do something and they can actually manipulate a serpent and make it do what they want it to do. You know, who knows what I'm talking about? Put up your hand if you have a clue what I'm talking about. Like, you know, they'll, they'll be in the basket and they'll play the flute and they'll stick their head up and, you know, do all this kind of stuff. Now, I'm not an expert on it, but here I'm reading about it in the Bible. And he's basically describing them as like a serpent who will not listen to any kind of, you know, instruction and, and basically God's word preaching to them. They become dull of hearing death to any kind of a rebuke, anything that's right, any of God's work. Now we're going to come back to Psalm 58. But I want you to turn back, if you would, to Psalm 11. Okay, because I've got to lay the foundation for the message here. Look at Psalm 11. Now we're going to do a lot of little psalms tonight. But you see, a lot of people have a preconceived idea of what they believe. And when they read the Bible, they want the Bible to fit what they believe. Instead of going to the Bible and saying, you know what, tell me what to believe, God. You know, and I remember it was a good day when I came to the conclusion. I said, you know, I need to put away every preconceived idea and just read the Bible and see what it says. And that's what I'm going to believe. Now, I don't care what the preacher says. I don't care what I was taught growing up. Look, the Bible has got to be our authority. And so the Bible is not a book that we, we find a verse proving what we believe. No, we need to read the Bible to find out what we ought to believe. Now, a lot of people have trouble coming to terms with some of the Bible's teachings. And some of the Bible's more negative teachings. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to believe it. They, they don't want to think about it. They don't want to go to a church that preaches it. But yet, there it is in black and white. 
and it's God's word. And we ought to just believe it and let it frame our mind and not sit there and say, well, you know, I don't, I don't believe, I don't agree with that. I just think God loves everybody. You know, and you, yeah, who's heard that before? I just believe that God loves everybody. Well, let's see if that's really true tonight, okay? Look at the Bible. Look at Psalm 11. It says in Psalm 11, verse 4, The Lord is in His holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold. His eyes try the children of men. The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked, and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. Now look, God does not love everybody. Now you can say that all you want. You can hear that preached all you want. People can get up and say it till they're blue in the face. It doesn't make it true. God does not love everybody. In fact, there are even some people whom God hates. And let me tell you the kind of people that God hates. People who are violent and people who love violence and people who are bloody and deceitful men. Look at, look at just the next, uh, well, let's see, go back to Psalm 5, actually. Just go back a few pages. Now, I used to believe that God loved everybody because that's what I heard so many times. And, you know, God did love everybody at one time or another. Every baby that's born, Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world is, is really a true song. Because, you know, when a baby's born in this world, God gives them life, God created them, God loves them. But people can push it with God too far. Where they can get to the point where God doesn't love them anymore. And I'll, I'll show you that in the Bible tonight and, and among other things that I'm going to preach. But look at Psalm 5, verse 5. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. Thou shalt destroy them that speak leasing. The Lord will abhor. Abhor means to hate. The Lord will abhor the bloody and deceitful man. Now I remember when I was a teenager, a, a, a young girl asked me a question. And I believe I was 15 years old. And she said to me, does God love everybody? And I said, yes, he does. And she said, then explain this verse. And she showed me in Malachi chapter 1, where it says, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. And she said, right there it says that he loved the one and hated the other. And you know what I did? I said, I can't believe you say that. I can't believe you're speaking hate to me. No, I said, you know what? I'm wrong. You're right. That's what I said. I said, you know what? You're right. God doesn't love everybody. Because here it is in front of me, black and white. You know, and, the, and literally, I can show you, and I'm not going to go through all of them. But I, I, one time I made a list of all the verses where God said he hates people. It's like 30 verses where God talks about hating people, okay? And, and yet people just don't want to accept it. They just want to believe that God loves everybody. But he doesn't. In fact, God is very peaceful toward those. Now, now, stop and think about this. What is violence? Now, violence may not be what you think it is, because violence comes from the word violate. And violence, look, look at Luke chapter 3. I'll just show you just, just to make sure that you see what, what violence is according to the Bible. Because, you know, we, we think a boxing match is violent. And that, you know, that's not violence according to the Bible. But look at, look at uh, Luke chapter 3. And look at verse 14. This is John the Baptist preaching, and uh, some soldiers come to him, and they ask him, you know, what they, what they should change about their lifestyle, you know, in order to live for God. And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, and what shall we do? And he said unto them, do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. Now, is he telling the soldiers not to fight? No, because he's telling them, be content with your wages. I don't think he's telling them, take a wage, but then don't do the job. Okay, that's not right. But he's telling them, take your wages, but don't do any violence. Okay? Violence is harming innocent people, is what it is. Because violence when you're violating someone. It's not just, oh, you know, we, we got in a fight, or, or I was defending my property. You know, if somebody breaks into your house and you kill them, that's not violence. Executing a murderer is not violence. Going on the battlefield and defending your country is not violence. Okay? You are doing your duty. But... Violence is when you harm someone innocent. Violence is to murder an innocent person. Violence would be to, to harm a child or, you know, to destroy women and children, you know, when you're supposed to be fighting, you know, on the battlefield against soldiers. Violence is, is uh, abortion, for example. That's violence, my friend. The most violent person is that abortion doctor who's killing that innocent life. And so we, you know, we may know, oh, that's, that's medicine. No, it's violence, according to the Bible. It's harming an innocent person. And let me tell you something. God hates 
those who are violent. God hates the serial killer tonight. God hates the rapist tonight. God hates the child molester tonight. God hates these people who go out and, and maliciously love violence. I mean, not even just they committed a violent act. No, they love violence. God says, if you love violence, I hate you. Now look back at Psalm 58 with that in mind. Now again, you say, well, man, I can't believe what you're preaching. I'm just reading Bible verses and, tell, and just expounding to you. I mean, I'm not really adding anything to this. I mean, I'm just reading what it says. You see, people can get, past, get to a point... And I, I want to read you another verse that just came to my mind in the book of Hosea, just to make sure that you understand this. But in Hosea chapter 7, let me turn there quickly. You know what? That's not where it is. Who knows the verse I'm looking for? Here's a, here's a little Bible quiz. In the book of Hosea where he says, I'll love them no more. Isn't that in chapter 7? I thought it was. Anybody know the Bible? Oh, here it is. No, I'm just kidding. Chapter 9, verse, verse 14. Hosea chapter 9, verse 14. Give them, O Lord, what wilt thou give? Give them a miscarrying womb and dry breasts. All their wickedness is in Gilgal, for there I hated them. This is God speaking. He says, For the wickedness of their doings I will drive them out of mine house. I will love them no more. All their princes are revolted. See, wait a minute. I think maybe when God loves, maybe when God hates people, He still loves them too. You know, I've actually had somebody say that to me. I tried to show somebody. Look, God, there are people who go too far, and they're too wicked, and God hates them. And they say, Well, I think God still loves them though, even though He hates them. Now, first of all, that's crazy. I mean, that doesn't even make any sense because hate and love are two opposite things. But then here it says right here, He says it both ways. He says, For there I hated them. For the wickedness of their doings, I will drive them out of my house. I will love them no more. Now, I will love them no more. Does that mean you used to love them? Yes. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But after God gave his son, and the people reject his son, and spit upon his son, and then they get more wicked and more wicked and more wicked and say no to God, no to God, and they shut out and they want to plug their ears like that serpent that will not be charmed, say, I will not listen to God's word, then eventually he will love them no more. And that's where he gets to the point where he hates them. Now, this is clear in the Bible. I mean, it, you know, you can't escape it. It's there. Let's go back to Psalm 58 with that in mind. Now, tonight I want to preach this sermon. And, you know, you've probably never heard a sermon like this before. Actually, you probably have if you've been going to church here for a while. But you know what? Here's my sermon. Why I hate Barack Obama. That's my sermon tonight. Because, you know, Barack Obama's coming to town tomorrow morning. Barack Obama is coming to town. And um, he's going to be here tomorrow morning. Who knew that he was coming to town? I didn't know. I just found out recently. You know, with his health care and everything like this. And I'm going to tell you something. I hate Barack Obama. You, you say, well, you just mean you, you don't like what he stands for. No, I hate the person. Amen. Oh, wait, well, you mean you just don't like his quality. No, I hate him. Now, I'm going to prove this from the Bible tonight, why I should hate Barack Obama. Why God wants me to hate Barack Obama. Why God hates Barack Obama. Now, some people may not like this sermon. But I've never yet preached a sermon with the goal that I hope people will like this sermon. And I'm not going to start tonight. Because it's not about what people like. It's not even about what I like. It's not about what you like. It's about what the Bible says. You say, well, you're not loving. Then why did I go out today in Phoenix, Arizona in the heat and go preach the gospel and get somebody saved? If I'm not loving. And if I don't love you, then why am I preaching you the truth in love? Why am I telling you? The person who loves you is the one who tells you the truth. Not the one who lies to you and says everything's great, everything's fine. Good, good, good God, good sin, cold hell. You know, that person doesn't love you. The person who loves you is the one who tells you the truth. Now look at Psalm 58. Now tell me if anything we read tonight contradicts my thesis here. God hates Barack Obama. I hate Barack Obama. Okay, look at verse 6. This is David praying to God in the book of Psalms. Break their teeth, O God, in their mouth. Break out the great teeth of the young lions, O Lord. 
Let them melt away as waters which run continually when he bendeth his bow to shoot his arrows. Let them be as cut in pieces. As a snail which melteth, let every one of them pass away. Like the untimely birth of a woman, that they may not see the sun. Before your pots can feel the thorns, he shall take them away as with a whirlwind, both living and in his wrath. The righteous shall rejoice when he seeth the vengeance. He shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked. So that a man shall say, Verily there is a reward for the righteous. Verily he is a God that judgeth in the earth. Now look at that. This is David praying against people. Cursing them as he prays. Praying that God will break their teeth out of their head. Isn't that what it said in verse 6? Praying that they will melt like a snail. Now you say, what is that about? Who has ever salted a slug? Come on, don't be shy. You know, when you're a kid, there's a little, you know, it, let's say there's a rainstorm. I grew up in Sacramento, California. There's a rainstorm. And then, you know, as soon as it gets sunny again, what happens? There's all these little snails and slugs that are going along the concrete. And, you know, when you're a child, you know, I would never do this anymore. I love all of God's creation. But when I was a child, you'd say, quick, go get the salt. Right? And you'd run in the house, and, you know, you run in, and you're rummaging through the cover, and you get that Morton salt shaker. Right? And you go out to the snail and you salt the snail. And what happens? It begins to melt. It melts away. Because I don't know why I can't explain the science behind it. But for some reason when you salt a snail or salt a slug. You know, a, a slug is nothing but a snail with no shell. Right? In, in German, actually, the word for slug is naked snail. Okay? You know, it doesn't have a shell. And so it's basically the same creature. And so, you know, you, you salt it, it melts away. David is praying in verse 8, as a snail which melteth, let every one of them pass away. Like the untimely birth of a woman. That's talking about a miscarriage. That they may not see the sun. He's basically saying, let them die like a miscarriage. Let them melt like a snail. Now, here's what's interesting. Turn to Psalm 109. Psalm 109. Let me show you why David is praying that they would melt like a snail. Psalm 109, and you know, the sermon's a lot of Bible tonight. I don't really even have to do much preaching tonight, because this, this sermon kind of preaches itself, you know, as we go down through the scripture. Look at Psalm 109, verse 1. Hold not thy peace, O God, of my praise, for the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful are opened against me. They have spoken against me with a lying tongue. They compassed me about also with words of hatred and fought against me without a cause. For my love, they are my adversaries, but I give myself unto prayer. And they have rewarded me evil for good, and hatred for my love. Set thou a wicked man over him, and let Satan stand at his right hand. When he shall be judged, let him be condemned, and let his prayer become sin. This is David speaking against the evildoer, cursing him in his prayer. Let his days be few, and let another take his office. Let his children be fatherless, and his wife a widow. Let his children be continually vagabonds and beg. Let them seek their bread also out of their desolate places. Let the extortioner catch all that he hath, and let the strangers spoil his labor. You say, you're not loving. Who are, you? are you talking to me or are you talking to God? I'm just reading God's word. See, David was the sweet, this is what the Bible calls David, the sweet psalmist of Israel. What a sweetheart. Listen to him. That's what the Bible, I didn't call it. The Bible calls him the sweet psalmist of Israel. Look it up. Let his posterity be cut off, verse 13, and in their generation falling, let their name be blotted out. Let the iniquity of his fathers be remembered with the Lord, and let not the sin of his mother be blotted out. I mean, he's, he's basically saying, you're mom. You know, he's saying, hey, let not the sin of his mother be blotted out. He said, because that he remembered not to show mercy, but persecuted the poor and needy man, that he might even slay the broken in heart. But watch this. This is the part I really wanted to show you, though, in verse 17. This has to do with the snail melting. As he loved cursing, so let it come unto him. As he delighted not in blessing, so let it be far from him. As he clothed himself with cursing like as with his garment, so let it come into his bowels like water, and like oil into his bones. Let it be unto him as the garment which covereth him, and for a girdle wherewith he is girded continually. 
Let this be reward, the reward of mine adversaries from the Lord and of them that speak evil against my soul. Now, what's he saying in verses 17 and 18? What goes around comes around. You love violence. You hate that which is right. You love cursing. Then it's going to come to you. You love violence. You love to harm others. You love to, to, to hurt or kill the unborn or the innocent or the righteous. He's saying God is going to bring that upon your own head. Because whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Now turn back to Psalm 58. And let me ask you this question. Why should Barack Obama melt like a snail? Why should Barack Obama die like the untimely birth of a woman? Why should his children be fatherless and his wife a widow, as we read in this passage? Well, I'll tell you why. Because since Barack Obama thinks it's okay to use a salty solution, right, to abort the unborn, because that's how abortions are done, my friend, we're using salt, right, saline solution. There are many ways to do an abortion. One of the most commonly used ways in America today is this injection of a saline solution and the embryo melts like a snail. And I'd like to see Barack Obama melt like a snail tonight because he needs to recompense what he has shown. He has spent a life of being pro-abortion. He has voted on legislation to not only kill the unborn, but to kill the newborn. I mean, when he was in Chicago in the state Senate, he voted, everyone else voted that if a, if a botched abortion actually lives and survives, that they would care for that child and give it medical treatment and care to keep it alive. And yet Barack Obama said, nope, let it die about a newborn baby. And yet I'm told by the preachers of 2009, love Barack Obama. Unbelievable. I'm told, love him. Pray for him. And we're going to get to that a little bit later in the message. Uh, respect him. Obey him. I mean, I, you know, I guess they, they want me to put a, a bumper sticker on the back of my car. I guess, obey Obama. You know, that's my new slogan. That's my motto. Obey him, love him, respect him, pray for him. God ordained him. God appointed him. <laughs> yeah, God appointed him to destroy this country for the wickedness of the United States of America. God appointed him because that's, that's, that's what our country has turned into. That's who we deserve as a president. But let me tell you something. I don't love Barack Obama. I don't respect Barack Obama. I don't obey Barack Obama. And I'd like to see Barack Obama melt like a snail tonight. Because he needs to recompense. He needs to reap what he sown. You see, any Christian will tell you that someone who commits murder should get the death penalty. Because that's what it says in Genesis chapter 9. That's what it says in the Mosaic Law. That's what it teaches throughout the Bible. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. From the image of God created he man. And, and, and when Barack Obama is going to push his uh, partial birth abortion, his salty saline solution abortion, hey, he deserves to be punished for what he's done. And I'm not going to pray for God to bless Barack Obama. This is my prayer tonight to Barack Obama. You see, your, your prayer is never, more, is never more right than when you pray God's Word. Now, I don't know if you've ever done this, but many times I like to pray God's Word. Like, you know, I, I have several psalms memorized. And, and, and a lot of times when I memorize the psalms, I like to pick psalms that are prayers that I would like to pray. Now, I haven't memorized this one yet, okay? But I've, I've memorized a lot of other psalms. I memorized uh, Psalm 120, one of my favorite psalms. Uh, psalm 121. Psalm 141. You know, these are psalms that I like to pray to God. You know, and I basically pray God's word to God. Okay? And I'm praying in God's own words. Now, obviously I pray in my own words predominantly. But I also like to take some of these prayers and make them my prayer. Now look, if somebody wants me, if somebody could twist my arm behind my back and tell me to pray for Barack Obama, this is what I'm going to pray. Because this is the only prayer that applies to him. Break his teeth, O oh God, in his mouth. You know, as a snail which melted, let him pass away. Like the untimely birth of a woman that he thinks, he calls it a woman's right to choose. You know, he thinks it's so wonderful, it ought to be, he ought to be aborted. It ought to be abort Obama. It ought to be the, the, the bottom. But look at this, look at chapter 59. And look, don't get uncomfortable, I'm just preaching God's word. Amen. Let me introduce you, since you, this is the Bible, okay? You know, 
Christian Bible. Bible Christian. Okay, now that you've become acquainted a little bit, you know, now you know who you're dealing with. Look at verse uh, chapter chapter number 59, verse 2. Deliver me from the workers of iniquity and save me from bloody men. Look, people who are bloody and violent are evil people. I mean, do you love Adolf Hitler? Do you love Joseph Stalin? Do you love Mao Zedong? Do you love these evil, sadistic butchers of history? No. The, if, if you were to meet Jeffrey Dahmer in real life, if you were to meet John Wayne Gacy, or if Adolf Hitler could come back from the dead and be in church, you, I'm sure you'd go shake his hand and tell him it's good to have you. No. The Bible said in, in uh, Hosea 9.14, throw them out of the congregation of the Lord. I will love them no more. Violent, bloody, wicked people. He's saying, get them away from me. Look at verse 5. Thou therefore, O Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, awake to visit all the heathen. Be not merciful to any wicked transgressors. This is David praying to God. And so this is not something I made up. This is God's word. Look if you would at Psalm 139, verse 19. Psalm 139, verse 19. You say, why are you preaching this? You know what? Because it makes me mad. I'm mad. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm fed up tonight. I'm angry tonight. Because I'm angered by a bunch of preachers who want to sit back and let America go to hell, let our freedoms go to hell, let the souls of, of America go to hell, and we all just sit back and just we're comfortable, we're lazy, we're lukewarm, we're neither cold nor hot, and we want to come to church and have our ears tickled. Hey, this isn't to tickle your ears, it's to give you a swift kick in the pants tonight. Because that's what you need every once in a while. You need to come to church and get a boot in your rear end. And that's what this sermon is. Because we don't need to constantly just have this, oh, it's great, it's wonderful. You know, I love to preach encouraging sermons. And there's nothing more encouraging than the Bible. But I'm here to tell you tonight that God is a God of wrath and vengeance. And that's the message that ought to be thundering from every pulpit in America today. People ought to be trembling today. The people in America ought to be scared to death and trembling and saying, oh, God, what are you going to do to our country? Oh, God, are we going to be able to survive? Oh, God, are you going to give us freedom? Or are you going to allow us to go into the depths of socialism and communism with Barack Obama? But instead, we're just, we just sit back. We're comfortable. Oh, yeah, this year will probably be like next, last year. And much more abundant. Oh, yeah, you know, we'll be fine. 2010 is going to be great. It's not going to be fun. Things are happening so fast in our country. And it's up to the man of God to warn you about it. To tell you about it. To point it out to you. And not just, you know, oh, you know, everything's great. God's in control. If you think God's in control of this country, you're insane. A madman is in control of this country. Wicked, evil people who are motivated by the love of money are the ones who are controlling our country. It's not God that's in control. I know your hyper-Calvinist tulip preacher told you that God's in control. But you know what? The devil is the God of this world, according to my Bible. The devil's the God of this world, and the devil is putting spiritual wickedness in high places, the Bible says. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. And let me name one for you. Barack Obama is one of the rulers of the darkness of this world. Against right. spiritual wickedness in high places. Hey, we are supposed to wrestle against it. Not say, oh, he's my president. He's not my president. I'm going to wrestle against it. Good. I'm going to wrestle against the spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, I'm not going to physically take up arms. Because we wrestle not against flesh and blood. But I'm going to tell you something. It's a spiritual battle tonight for the minds of Americans and Christians. We ought to take God's word, the sword of God's word, and preach the truth. Amen. And to do battle with the forces of evil in this country. Oh, I, I, maybe he's saved. He's a Pentecostal. He's a holy roller charismatic. Didn't you see his pastor wearing a dress and everything? You know, his pastor's got the dress and the gold. Woo! That's where he goes to church. He believes, you know, he doesn't believe the Bible. He mocks the Bible. I heard him make fun of the Bible. He said, you know, creation, you know, Adam. What, what was it he was mocking the Bible? Somebody know more about this than I do. I don't know. 
Didn't he get up and say something like, uh, what was that thing? I was on the tip of my tongue. Somebody help me out with this. He, about Deuteronomy. Something about Deuteronomy or, you something know. Yeah, oh yeah. This, oh yeah, this is what he said. Like, you actually expect me to put the Sermon on the Mount into practice? <laughs> you know what I mean? He mocked, he ridiculed the Sermon on the Mount. Okay, I remember that part. And he said, you know, I don't know. He said something about, oh yeah, you, you, you guys just want to cling to your guns and your Bibles. Wasn't that one of the statements? That, that was one of his famous. The laws in the Old Testament, are we going to go back to doing this, killing adultery? Yeah, he was basically listing off the laws in the Old Testament, laughing about them, saying how silly they are. I think his laws are pretty silly. I, I think his policies are pretty stupid. In fact, I read the Bible. I don't. I, you know, I've read the Book of Deuteronomy recently, and I don't think I laughed one time. It's not exactly a comedy. You know, I was reading De Deuteronomy. I was thinking, man, this would be cool. this is great. I wish I lived in this society. Man, these are great laws. Oh, how love I thy law! It's my meditation night and day. Well, yeah, Deuteronomy. They didn't even have universal health care provided for them. Look at Deuteronomy. <laughs> you know, I didn't. You know. Look at all the uninsured back in the nation of Israel. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I don't know what that is. You're getting me off. You're getting me off track with my sermon here. Okay. Okay, but let's say let's say this. Well, did we did we look at Psalm 139 yet? Look down at Psalm 139, verse 19. And, and look how consistent God is. He says, Surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men. Notice the, the continual mention of blood, violence, murder, right? And let me tell you, our country is run by some bloody people. Yeah. Not, you know, abortion is one thing. The abortion holocaust marches forward at, what, three to 4,000 a day? Mm -hmm. And I'm sure God's just going to look the other way and just forgive. Now, you see, he'll forgive you if you believe on Jesus Christ. But nations can't believe on Jesus Christ. People, individuals believe on Jesus Christ. George Washington said this, nations can't be judged in the next world. They're judged in this world. We're judged in the next. Nations are judged here in this world. And I believe that that's a scriptural concept. We see nations go into captivity, go into bondage when they shed innocent blood, like uh, King Manasseh did, for example. But look what he says in verse number 8. So he says, Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men, for they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. Do not I hate them, O Lord? So who does he hate? God's enemies, these bloody, violent people. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee. Now who's talking? This is David. And am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Now turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2 if you would. 1 Timothy chapter number 2 because people will, will respond to this and say, well, you know, here's my policy. I just say pray, you know, pray for him. Pray that God will open his eyes. God has already blinded his eyes because he's already pushed it too far. People like this, it's too late for them. Oh, it's never too late for anybody. You know, that would be a great greeting card. Maybe you can make some money with that. Maybe you can talk to Hallmark. You know, and maybe you, you know, make a bummer sticker, you know, or an inspirational poem or something. You know, that's never too late for anybody. But, you know, the Bible teaches that it is too late. He said, I called, you refused. He said, you had, he said, therefore, he said, I'll give you up, Romans chapter 1. Give you over. Give you up. Mm -hmm. Then shall they call upon the Lord, but I will not hear. He said, I will not save. It says in John 12, they could not believe because God blinded their eyes because they rejected him and rejected him and rejected him. Finally, Jesus just told them, you know what? Forget it. I'm done with you. And they said that God blinded their eyes. John chapter 12. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. Don't, don't come to church and get upset at me and tell me I'm preaching false. You need to read. You need to read John 12. You need to study this. And then you'll come to church and say, uh-huh, that's exactly what I read. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. Verse 1. The Bible says, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks. Okay, so those are four things, right? What is a supplication? What is a prayer? Intercession. Supplication is when I'm basically, you know, trying to bend God's... Have you ever heard the word supple? It's something that, that bends, okay? Basically, 
he's saying, you know, it's basically bend, trying to bend God's, you know, trying to get God to do something for you that you want, okay? Making supplication, like for example, people would go to the king and make supplication before him, like trying to get him to change his mind, trying to get him to, to do something for them. What is a prayer? A prayer is asking for something to be given to you, okay? That's what a prayer is. Like, have you ever heard this term, I pray thee? People say that throughout the Bible, I pray thee, they're asking for something. Okay, so supplication is when you got, want God to change the circumstances. Prayer is when you want God to give you something. Intercession is when you're praying either for or against someone else. You say, against someone? The Bible says in Romans chapter 11, Walk ye not what the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel. Say, Moses made intercession for Israel in Exodus chapter 33. And then giving of thanks for all men. That would be if I said, thank you, Lord, for, you know, my children. Thank you for my wonderful wife. Thank you for, you know, my church member. Thank you for this person. Thank you for, the, you know, the, the, I mean, aren't you thankful for your friends, your family? You, love, you know, that's thanking God for, for people. He says, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Now, according to verse 6, did Jesus Christ die for Barack Obama? Absolutely. He died for everybody. Now, when little Barry Monsanto, or what, what was his name? Barry Santoro, you know, that's what his name used to be. You know, before he put on his cool name, Barack Obama. Barry Santor. What is it? Barry Santoro. That's the name that was blotted out. Okay, no, I'm just kidding. But anyway, Barry Santoro. When little Barry was playing baseball as a kid, you know, in, where, in Kenya, where he was born or whatever, and he's, you know, using a stick and a, and a, and a mango or something, I don't know. But where, you know, <laughs> I'm just trying to paint the image for it. When little Barry. Is, is over there playing stickball in Africa. Hey, God loved him. God wanted him saved. Who knows? Maybe even some missionary came to his house when he was a child and, and gave him the gospel and, and tried to get him saved. Very likely. You know, there are a lot of missionaries in Africa. Who knows? What, you know, but I'll promise you one thing that Jesus died for him. I'll promise you one thing that God gave him opportunities to be saved. That he had opportunities to hear it. Because God never turns anybody over to a reprobate mind until they've had ample opportunities yeah. to hear the gospel. I mean, in, you know, in my life, I've heard the gospel so many times. I've had people knock my door with the gospel. I've had people hand me a track and try to talk to me and give me the gospel throughout my life. You know, I was already saved because I got saved at the age of six. But I promise you that Jesus died for him. I promise you that he heard the gospel. I promise you that he had chances and God wanted him to get saved and some preacher pleaded with him to get saved or some soul winner somewhere wanted him to be saved. But I'm going to tell you, there came a point when he just pushed it too far and, he just, and, and that's when people go down this downward spiral where they just become so wicked you can't even understand how could a human being be that wicked. I mean, you ever pick up the newspaper and hear about some of the atrocities the Jeffrey Dahmer, the John Wayne Gacy, and you just say, how can a human being do it? They're not human, they're an animal. God says that he'll give them the heart of a beast. That's why they can do it. He said he'll, he'll make them past feeling, take away their conscience, and they're just animals. You know, Joseph Stalin was an animal, sadistic murderer, monster. But look here, they say, wait a minute, it says here in verse 2, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all God that's not. Now, first of all, Barack Obama is not our king. We don't have we have one king in America, the Lord Jesus Christ, because we don't live in a monarchy, we live in a republic. And so we the last time we had a king was in 1776. His name was King George III, and we haven't had a king since. Now look. Is Barack Obama an authority? Yes. Yes, he is an authority figure because he's the president of the United States. And you say, well, the Bible says there we're supposed to pray for those that are in authority. Okay, but why should we pray for those in authority? That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Now, let's get this in the context, because what did he say? Who did he, who did he say we were supposed to pray for in verse 1? 
It's at the end of the verse. Who are we supposed to pray for in verse 1? All men. Why are we supposed to pray for all men? Because God will have all men to be saved. Look at verse 4. Because God will have all men to be saved. He wants all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Right? That's why we're praying for them. So that they'll get saved. Why are we supposed to pray for our leaders? So that they will allow us to lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Now turn back to the book of Jeremiah. Because no, no scripture is of any private interpretation. You can't just take one verse and take it out of the Bible and interpret it outside the Bible. The Bible, do you believe that the Bible has no contradictions in it? Because I, I believe there's no contradiction in the Bible. Now in order to believe that there's no contradiction in the Bible, we have to take all of the scripture and harmonize it. Okay? Like if our interpretation of a certain verse contradicts another verse, wouldn't you say we have the wrong interpretation? It needs to harmonize. So when we have a clear scripture, and then here's another scripture, and our interpretation doesn't harmonize, we need to make that harmonize. Because, look, the Bible doesn't contradict itself. Now look at Jeremiah chapter 7. Here's some things that you need to keep in mind. Jeremiah 7.16 is the first one. Because we want to get a whole picture from the Bible. And, and look, the Bible doesn't contradict itself. That's why there's no verse in the entire Bible from Genesis 1.1 to Revelation 22.21 that says that God loves everybody. Because if there were a verse like that, that would be a contradiction in the Bible. There's a verse that said he loved all the world and therefore he gave. But there's no verse that says that today he loves her. You know, in the past he loved Barry Santana. Okay, the, the, the guitar hero or, you know, whatever. Barry Santora. Okay, I don't know why. I'm, I'm having a mental block here. I'm having a hard time getting this in. But he doesn't love him today. And, and if there was a verse that said he did, then it would be a contradiction in the Bible which does not exist. But look at, look at Jeremiah 7, 16. Therefore, pray not thou for this people, neither lift up cry nor prayer for them. Neither make intercession to me, for I will not hear thee. Now, wasn't that two of the things that were on the list, prayer and intercession? And God is saying that there are certain people, according to this verse, that we should not pray for and that we should not make intercession for. And if we do, then God won't hear us. Now, let me ask you something. Do you know the difference between declarative, exclamative, interrogative sentence and imperative sentence? What, what is an imperative sentence? It's a command. Okay. What kind of a sentence is this in verse 16? Therefore, pray not thou for this people. That is an imperative sentence. That is a command from God. So wouldn't you say that if God gives us a command, and then we violate that command, we would be sinning? I mean, if God says, don't do this, and we just do it. Isn't that a sin? Okay. Look, look at Jeremiah chapter number 14. Look at Jeremiah 14. Jeremiah 14, verse 11. Now here, God, God makes it a little more clear for us. Because, you know, we want to know exactly what God means. Look at verse 11. Then said the Lord unto me, Pray not for this people for their good. So it's okay to pray like a Psalm 58 type of prayer for these people. But he says, don't pray for their good. Don't pray that they'll have a good day. Don't pray that God will bless them. Don't pray that God will give them a long life. Don't pray for their good health. No, pray not for these people for their good. Look at Jeremiah 11. Jeremiah 11, let's get, a, let's get a, an idea of who these people are. Let's start with, uh, we could really read the whole chapter, but for sake of time, let's just start with verse 9. You can go back and read this chapter. But in Jeremiah 11, 9, the Bible reads, And the Lord said unto me, A conspiracy is found among the men of Judah and among the inhabitants of Jerusalem. You see, God is one of those conspiracy people. You know what I mean? Anyway, just kidding. Verse number 10. They are turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers, which refused to hear my words. Now, doesn't that remind you of what it said in Psalm 58, where it said they will not listen to the, the charming, like a servant who won't listen to the charmer? They will not hear my word. The Bible says in Proverbs 1, he says that they hated God's word, and that's why he rejected them. In Romans chapter 1, they hated God. They, they didn't even want to retain God in their knowledge. So he said that they will not 
They refused to hear his words, and they went after other gods to serve them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant which I made with their fathers. Therefore thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring evil upon them, which they shall not be able to escape. And though they shall cry unto me, I will not hearken unto them. Then shall the cities of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem go and cry unto the gods unto whom they offer incense. But they shall not save them at all in the time of their trouble. For according to the number of, the, of thy cities were thy gods, O Judah, and according to the number of the streets of Jerusalem, have ye set up altars to that shameful thing, even altars to burn incense unto Baal. Now, Baal is none other than Satan, okay? Baal Zebub is what he's called in another part, and then Jesus refers to Satan as Beelzebub in the New Testament. So, according to Jesus, Baal is Satan. And a lot of these people that worship Baal, what did they do? They would sacrifice their children unto these, you know, unto Baal, unto Molech. They would uh, pass through their children through the fire. Look at verse 14. Therefore, pray not thou for this people, neither lift up a cry or prayer for them, for I will not hear them in the time that they cry unto me for their trouble. What is my beloved to do in my house, seeing she hath wrought lewdness with many, and the holy flesh is passed from thee? When thou doest evil, then thou rejoicest. Let me tell you something. Oh, Barack Obama has wrought lewdness in America. America has become lewd. What does lewd mean? L-E-W-D? Uh, Lewd-like. Lewd-like. Obscene, obscene yeah. right? Dirty, filthy, homosexuality, promiscuity, all the, you know, everything that's on the billboard, the TV, sensuality, lewdness. We don't even know what lewdness means anymore because we're just surrounded by it, we're inundated with it. The things that we would look at and probably just think they're normal parts of American culture, God would say, you know, that's lewd. The way that woman is on that billboard, the way she's dressed, the way she's posed, hey, God would call that lewdness. We might think it's normal because that's how we grew up, but God says it's wicked, it's lewdness, it's nudity. He said, pray not for this three times in the book of Jeremiah. He describes their sins, he describes their abominations, he, he describes their atrocities, and he says, you know what? Do not pray for these people. And yet you're going to tell me that I'm supposed to pray for the socialist devil, murderer, infanticide, who wants to see uh, young children, and he wants to see babies killed through abortion and partial birth and all these other things. You're going to tell me I'm supposed to pray for God to give him a good lunch tomorrow while he's in Phoenix, Arizona. Nope. I'm not going to pray for his good. I'm going to pray that he dies and goes to hell. When I go to bed tonight, that's what I'm going to pray. Do you say, are you just saying that? No. When I go to bed tonight, Stephen L. Anderson is going to pray for Barack Obama to die and go to hell. He said, why would you do that? That, that our country could be saved. Amen. That innocent lives could be saved. It's not just the abortion. You know, I, it's, it's, all the, it's all the warfare, too, that our country has no business being involved in. That kills innocent people. You can say whatever you want. But our country, uh, you know, oh, you're un-American. Okay, Sean Hannity, you know, I'm sick of you. You don't even believe in Jesus Christ. And don't call me un-American when I say that our country needs to quit trying to police the world right. and killing a bunch of innocent people around the world. There are over one million people dead in Iraq. Why? To advance the agendas of people who love money, right. the military-industrial complex, that want to just, you know... Uh, sacrifice the lives of our young boys for their own financial interests. Every veteran I've ever talked to that came back from Iraq told me the same thing. I've never to this day talked to a veteran of that Iraq war that said, what we're doing over there is right. I believe in it. I mean, seriously. I've talked to, to probably eight different people who came back and they said it's a joke. They said, we don't belong there. And yet people are dying over there. Because we, because we have sent our troops to meddle in other people's affairs. Yeah. yeah, it's true. And people are dying. People are, are, are killed as a, as a result of it. That's not popular to say as a Baptist or as a Christian or as a conservative. But you know what? It's the truth. Amen. And I'm going to preach the truth. God never told us to run the whole world. God never told us to have a united nations. No, he said separate nations. And God does not want us ruling the world through the United Nations, which is nothing more than a one world government getting ready for the Antichrist. That's Bible preaching, by the way. I grew up with that preaching in the 1980s. 
I grew up with preaching against the one world government, against the European Union, against the United Nations. That's what preachers used to preach because they'd show us in the Bible how one day there's going to be a one world government and they say it was of Satan. That's what, I, that's what I grew up with. Train up a child the way he should go and when he's 28 years old, he'll stand behind the pulpit and be preaching it in 2009 whether people want to hear it or not. And you know what? We don't, there is no war in Iraq. There is no war in Afghanistan. Wars are declared... That's when Congress declares war. The last time Congress declared war was in World War II. We're over there enforcing United Nations resolutions. I talked to a guy in the airport the other day who was a veteran of, of Iraq and Afghanistan. He said, I was fighting with Italian troops. I was fighting with Brit. He was naming all the countries. We're not over there as Americans fighting against an enemy. No. We're over there with the one world government, the United Nations. It's wicked. Shedding innocent blood at home and abroad. And he said, don't pray for these violent people. Don't play, pray for these sickening people. Don't pray for these evil people. See, he, wants us to, he wanted us to pray for Barry when he was a little kid playing stickball in Kenya. That's when we ought to have been praying for him. That's when some preacher should have went over there and preached in the gospel and, and got him saved if he would have received it. I'm sure he had opportunities and did not receive it. But you know, it's too late for them. It's too late. And by the way, if we're supposed to pray for those that are in authority to the end that we would live a quiet and peaceable life, tell me something. Is it peace when 3,000 babies are dying in America every day? Would you call that peaceful? That's not peace. I want to live a quiet and peaceable life, and I can't do that with Barack Obama in office. With Barack Obama in office... You know, and, and, and by the way, most of this, everything I'm saying pretty much applies to George W. Bush, too. So, you know, just, just deal with that. That's the truth. He, he never did one thing. What did he do to ever stop abortion? What did he ever do to, 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 to stop the queers from taking over? No, he was promoting it, okay? He hired more sodomites than any other president in the history of the United States, George W. Bush. He spent more money than any president in the history of the United States. He's a socialist, period. But you know what? How can I live a peaceable life when I can't drive from San Diego to Phoenix without getting my head bashed in? Mm -hmm. That's not very quiet. That's not peace. Okay? Yeah, how can I live a peaceable life when people are dying? You know, babies are dying all around me. Innocent, innocent. Oh, they're just babies. Somebody's got to stand up and speak for those who can't speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. Turn back, if you would, to the book of uh, 2 Kings. And uh, I'm almost done tonight, but... <clears throat> Back to the book of 2 Kings and uh, verse number chapter oh, I'm sorry chapter number good night that's the wrong place this is interactive preaching tonight where's Jehu here he is for the chapter number uh, chapter number nine. Here we go. All right. Chapter number nine, verse number seventeen. Sorry, it took me a minute. Second Kings chapter nine, verse seventeen. Let's look. Let's look at verse sixteen. So Jehu rode in a chariot and went to Jezreel. Now, what does the word Jezreel mean? Vengeance. You can learn that in the book of Hosea. God explains that. The word Jezreel means vengeance. I didn't get that from a dictionary. That's taught in the book of Hosea. This is the place of vengeance all throughout the Bible. It's, it, it's a place that occurs in many books of the Bible. If you know the Bible, you've read a lot about Jezreel. He said, So Jehu rode in a chariot and went to Jezreel, for Joram lay there. And Ahaziah, king of Judah, was come down to see Joram, and there stood a watchman on the tower of Jezreel, and he spied the company of Jehu as he came and said, I see a company. And Joram said, Take an horseman and send to meet them, and let him say, Is it peace? So there went one on horseback to meet him, and said, Thus saith the king, Is it peace? What's the context? Jehu was told by God to destroy this wicked king. He was anointed by a prophet. He opened up a box. He anointed him with oil and said, God has named you the king of Israel. Go slay this man. That's what he's doing. Joram. He's going to kill Joram. He says, uh, is it peace? And Jehu said, what hast thou to do with peace? Turn thee behind me. And the watchman told, saying, the messenger came to them, but he cometh not again. Then he sent out a second on horseback, which came to them and said, Thus saith the king, is it peace? And Jehu answered, What has thou to do with peace? Turn thee behind me. 
And the watchman told, saying, He came even unto them and cometh not again. And the driving is like the driving of Jehu, the son of Nimshai, for he driveth furiously. This is road rage. So he's driving angrily. It says uh, in verse 21, And Joram said, Make ready. And his chariot was made ready. Now Joram's going out himself. He's not trusting these messengers who aren't coming back. And Joram, king of Israel, and Ahaziah, king of Judah, went out each in his chariot. And they went out against Jehu and met him in the portion of Naboth the Jezreelite. Now remember, this is the man that his father Ahab had murdered. He murdered Naboth. And it came to pass when Joram saw Jehu that he said, is it peace, Jehu? And he answered, What peace? So long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many. And Joram turned his hands and fled and said to Ahaziah, There's treachery, O Ahaziah. And Jehu drew a bow with his full strength and smote Jehoram between his arms. And the arrow went out of his heart and he sunk down in his chair. So basically, to this question, he did, Is it peace? Is it peace? Is it peace? Is it peace? What peace? With this wicked Jezebel, her whoredoms, her witchcraft, her wickedness. And they shed innocent blood. Is also, you, know, you find that in the passages if you study. He said, there's no peace. And he pulled back the arrow and shot it. And the arrow shot through his heart and came out the other side. And he sunk down in the chariot. Now let me ask you today, is it peace? While the whoredoms and witchcrafts of the U.S. government and Barack Obama continue? While socialism takes over our country, steals the the bread out of our pantry and puts us into slavery and bondage while the abortion holocaust marches forth, not just legal in America. It'd be one thing if abortion were just legal. No. Sanctioned with government dollars. Paid for by your tax. I mean, you are forced to pay for abortion if you work in the United States of America. It's, it's taken out of your check. And it's going to abortion. Believe it or not, it's true. We send millions of dollars for abortions in Africa. We send millions of dollars to Planned Parenthood for abortions right here at home. Is it peace? I asked the question that the desk, is it peace? God said no. Jehu said no. And then here's what they said to him. Oh, it's treachery. You traitor. You're un-American. I'm not the traitor tonight. The Ahaziahs of this world may call Stephen Anderson a traitor. The, the, the Jorms of this world will say, oh yeah, you're a traitor. You're un American. Nope, I'm American from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. Hey, I believe in this country. I believe in the way it was founded, the principles of liberty and just, not health care for all. I know, I know you might have, you, know, you may not have read it in a while. It doesn't say food, clothing, jobs, green energy, and health care for all. No. <laughs> It says life, liberty, and justice for all. Justice for everyone. We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal. And are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life. And guess what? God created every baby. And it has a right to life. God doesn't create them the moment that they're born. Do you think that God comes and does an act of creation the moment that it's born? That baby already exists in the womb. Yeah. He created it. When the seed from the man and the egg from the woman come together, science doesn't understand it. How God creates life at that moment. And from there, that life just grows. But life begins at conception. By any scientific definition. It multiplies, it moves, it grows. I mean, God created it. And this country was founded upon the fact that when you're created in the womb, you have the right to be alive. Because God gives you life. And only God has the right to take away that life. Or to mandate in His Word that that life be taken away. And so God gives life. God is the author of liberty. God gives freedom. God gives us justice and righteousness. And if we are going to have peace, then people ought, need to have the right to be alive no matter how old they are or young they are. And by the way, the next thing that comes after this infanticide and abortion is euthanasia for the elderly. That's the next step. You know, it's always prey upon the weak. You know why? Because it's evolution. Survival of the fittest. I mean, if you're an atheist and you believe in evolution, this fits right in with your paradigm. Survival of the fittest, right? Oh, this baby has Down syndrome? Oh, this elderly person has a terminal illness. Let's just pull the plug. 
That's wicked. No, they have the right to be alive. Feed them. Feed those who can't feed themselves. Clothe those who can't clothe themselves. Care for them. Love them. And so, no, it's not peace. There's no peace when the whoredoms and wickedness of Obama continue. And I'm going to tell you something. You'll be called a traitor when you, when you believe this. You'll be called treacherous. You'll be called, oh, enemy combatant, terrorist. Traitor, terrorist, enemy. Nope. We're not revolutionaries. We're not trying to overthrow the government. We are counter revolutionaries because the revolution is what's going on right there in Phoenix at 8 a.m. tomorrow where we are where Obama is overturning the Constitution, overturning the Declaration of Independence, overturning everything that we believe as a country, overturning 200 and some years of history. He is the revolutionary and it's a it's a socialist communist revolution. We are the counter-revolutionary saying, no, we don't want change. We want to go back to the way it was started. Amen. A country under God, a free country, a country of liberty and justice for all. Amen. Anybody, everyone, whatever their, whatever their race, whatever their citizenship, hey, they're born with liberty, created with liberty. The government doesn't give us our liberty. The government is only supposed to protect our liberty. Amen. Our liberty comes from God. You know what the first thing that God told Adam and Eve was? To be free. He said, of all the trees of the garden, thou mayest freely eat. God made man free. He didn't tell him, for breakfast you're going to eat that tree. And then for lunch you'll eat that tree. And then for dinner you'll eat that tree. And there's a special tax for eating that tree. No. He said, look, there's only one tree that belongs to me. And you're not going to eat my tree. That's God's tree. This belongs to God. The knowledge of good and evil belongs only to God. The rest is for you. Be free. Choose your own meal. Eat what you want to eat. Adam, what do you want to name the animals? That's what he said. Read Genesis. He said, Adam, you name the animals, and whatever you name it, Adam, that'll be the name. And Adam named the animals. Adam ate whatever he wanted. He called them all by He lived in freedom. But he chose to sin. That's when his, then it just became, ever since then, man wants to rule over you. He wants to enslave you. He wants to take advantage of you because of sin. And so I hope you understand tonight why I hate Barack Obama. Don't tell me to love him. Don't tell me I'm unloving. I'm, I'm, I'm a loving God. Anybody who knows me in real life, you know, because this is just preaching. No, I'm just kidding. Anybody who knows me knows that I'm a very loving person. I'm a nice guy, honestly. But you know what? I don't love people who hurt innocent people. Because I love the innocent people that they're hurting. You can't love the child and love the murderer who's murdering the child. I mean, think, just stop and think for a minute. Well, I love this child, but I also love the person who's murdering them right now. What? Look, stop and think about this. Who, who in here has children? Put up your hand. What if someone came in and murdered your children? And you, oh, I love them. Don't, don't, don't tell me anything bad about them. I love them. You'd think that I was a, a monster. And you know what? God does not love the pedophile and the rapist and the bloody and deceitful worker of iniquity. He said he hates them. And I believe the Bible tonight that he hates them. I think God looks down and says, man, I hate that guy. You say, well, why is he in office? Because you know what? God allows this world to run its course. I mean, he's not, he's not up there just... If he were, it'd be a much better place. One day he will. It's called the millennium, when Jesus will rule this world. Oh, Jesus is up on his throne. Everything's okay. When his throne is on this earth, everything will be okay. A thousand years of peace. No blood will be shed during that thousand years. It's going to be a peaceful time on this earth. Even the lion will lay down with the lamb. Even the animal kingdom will not destroy one another. It's going to be a wonderful time. But today, there are spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, I'm preaching against Barack Obama. It's not all him. But he is just the, the tip of the sword. Okay, He is the figurehead of spiritual wickedness in high places. And he's coming to Arizona tomorrow. 
don't go there and, and, and scream and cheer for him. I know you were planning on it. <laughs> don't go there and, and get a tear in the eye. No, go to the prayer closet and get a tear in the eye for our country. And if I go there, which I'm not, because I'm busy tomorrow, but if I went there, I'd be there to say, down with Obama, okay? I'd be down there to, you know, I'd be down there protesting Obama, that's all. <clears throat> But I'm not a I'm not really a protest kind of a guy. I'm a preacher. And so I'm preaching you what the Bible teaches tonight. Take it and let it sink down into your ears. Go home and read the chapter. Go home and read Jeremiah 7, Jeremiah 11, Jeremiah 14. Go home and read the Psalms. Read Psalm 58. Read Psalm 69. Read Psalm 109. Read the Psalms that we're dealing with tonight. Read Psalm 139. And you'll see that that's what the Bible says. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Father, we love you and we thank you, dear God, that this world's not our home. We're just passing through. And our conversation's in heaven from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for heaven and salvation. Thank you that uh, we could go out this afternoon and every week and give people the good news about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, please deliver us. Save us. Help us, dear God. We are in perilous times. It's a scary time that we're living in, dear God. But we can be of good cheer because we know that you've overcome the world. Please protect us, dear God. We don't want to be enslaved. We don't want to be persecuted, dear God. We want to live a quiet and peaceful life. We want to live a life of peace and blessing. And therefore, dear God, we want, a Barack, we want Barack Obama to melt like a snail. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right.